an awfully early hour to start a DEF CON talk, but I appreciate your being here and uh, let's give it the best we can. Uh, Bruce Denier just said to me as I was musing about, well, how much truth can I tell? And he said, that's your job. That's why you're back after 17 years of speaking here. Your job is to mirror the community and say what you see. Uh, and, and, and tell the truth. Uh, next month I'll be in London for a project and it is called, ironically, The Truth. And it is about surveillance and the national security state and what we can anticipate in the future. It is run by artists. I'll be speaking in Poland the next month to curators of art museums because artists are the only ones with the imagination to imagine the kind of future we're going into. Uh, artists and literary uh, people and right brain people who are willing to uh, plunge to the edges of their intuition to grasp that the unpredictable and uh, ineluctable uh, life changers and game changers in society are not things we can point to in a linear way. We don't know what's coming and therefore those who synthesize and integrate uh, as I will talk about later uh, might be able to present a, a picture that has some hope for illuminating what's coming. Now, the talk uh, officially is about what I said 17 years ago. Uh, here's the t-shirt, DEF CON 4. When I keynoted DEF CON 4, there were a total of 300 people at the con instead of the 10,000 that are here now. And uh, what I said then, which I'm gonna use as points of reference for uh, what's going on, and then what I see coming in the future. I did quote Mudge in my abstract, and that's an accurate quote. Mudge, I said um, it was called Hacking is Practice for Transplanetary Life in the 21st Century. And Mudge said, some of us knew exactly what you were talking about. He's at DARPA now. And some of us thought you were crazy. Being ca called crazy is something you have to endure. It's like in the stock market, being early and being wrong uh, are very difficult to distinguish. You may see correctly. Uh, but the timing is important and the, the information that's delivered has to connect to the cognitive structures people already hold and that's going to be increasingly difficult given the complexity uh, and, uh, and diversity of the points of view that we will be called upon to hack. Uh, my fear is that hacking is, is not as much in evidence at this quote hacking convention as I would like. This is a conference now about the information security industry. Uh, it's about business and there is a lot of theme park modules for hacking which continue to proliferate and be maintained kind of like diverse rings of a circus around that fundamental fact. And so I don't know if it's hewing to what Bruce Potter uh, said uh, some years ago to Simple Nomad he said, I remember a conversation in the hotel bar for the system to work, our system, it must never grow up and it should always make us smile. In other words, the heart of a young hacker, the duplicity and the larceny in that heart, untrained by experience, must still be alive on the edges of exploration and passion in order to pursue the art and science of hacking. So you have to continue to manifest not merely business related or self-serving related interests, but as uh, Wilson said in Consilience, all artists, all scientists are characterized by passion and obsessiveness and daring. And daring means acting differently from those assimilated uncritically into the consensus reality of what I call humplings. Some of you know this book which came out two years ago. It's called Mind Games. There's a story in here called Break Memory. Break Memory is about the masters of society who see themselves as the 10% at the head of the hump curve, the bell curve that moves slowly through society in time. 80% are in the hump. They're the humplings. And then 10% are the dregs. The masters keep the dregs so the humplings will be glad they're not dregs and be grateful to the masters for keeping them in the hump as they move society forward. But the humplings are generally those who are assimilated unselfconsciously and uncritically into the consensus reality which increasingly in the world in which we live is one of spin, deception, simulation and manufactured consent. So, how do you do that? How do you do all that going forward? It's not the same world it was in 1996. 
hacking Simple Nomad said, and I'm going to quote him because he's not here, and he's one of the great wise people in this world, and I miss him. Sorry you're not here, Nomad. Uh, he said, uh, meaning this for the children to whom I'm going to speak on Sunday at the DEF CON Kids track, uh, hacking for those who are older seems to get harder, but it's only because we older folks get stuck in our ways, and if we don't learn how to hack the new stuff, we get lost. So learn to see the difference between something really hard and something really hard because all the new things are nothing like what I know. And the danger, of course, is if, if you're an engineer, uh, you may become so good at computer science, at information security, at engineering, that you uh, have a feedback loop from your own work and life that says, this is what I need to get better and better at, and you exclude all of those other disciplines and domains that are increasingly being manifest uh, in, in, our, in our worlds. Um, I was once asked to speak uh, on UFO phenomena, which I'll mention briefly later, uh, to astronomers in Chicago. And you always like to know who's going to be in the audience. Who's, how smart are they? How educated are they? How receptive might they be to interesting but anomalous ideas? And uh, he said, well, they work at Motorola, and they work here, and they work there. I said, well, it's a pretty educated group then. And he said, well, yeah, but they're engineers. <laughs> uh, now, he was an engineer. I wouldn't say that about engineers because I love uh, and respect engineers. But he was one, and what he meant was, as engineers, they were really good at having learned the discipline that they needed to know to be engineers. So I go back to what a friend at NSA said, are the unanswered and unspoken questions in this domain. How do you live vibrantly? How do you free the mind? How do you live in a world without walls. Now, I'm going to go back to hackers 17 years ago. There are a lot of silverbacks walking around who were here 17 to 20 years ago. And we need to relearn to see with the beginner's eyes because only the constant reinvention of ourselves is going to be up to the challenges of the times. It's not like I said then, you need to be able to transform yourself and use personas, not only in social engineering ways, but in societally beneficial ways. You not only need to do that, but you need to reinvent yourself again and again and again. Yes, you need to take the red pill, but then you need to take the red pill again. It's a daily dose like antibiotics that you have to take day after day after day because the red pill discloses what's real at the base of what we believe by consensus. And if you don't keep plunging and drilling deeper, you won't see it. Don't forget what Langdon Winner said, one of my favorite quotes. He said, to invent a new technology requires a society invent the people who will use it. All older practices, relationships, identities, fall by the wayside. New practices, new relationships and identities take root. In case after case, computerization and digitalization means pre-existing cultural forms are going liquid. They're losing their former shape as they are retailored for computerized expression. That was what I picked up on 17 years ago, the immense engine of transformation that the IT revolution really meant on the cutting edge of which hackers were then. What's happened as a result of the IT revolution is that the revolution has accelerated the rate of change and that reshaping of social, political, and economic reality in every domain of human society. And that's why it becomes so difficult to get your mind around what is really happening. When I'm introduced as a futurist, I say, that's ridiculous. I can't even describe the present. But if you live way in the past, then the present will sound to you like the future. Now, what's happened as a result of the proliferation of the multiplicity of domains of expertise, I mean, think of it this way. The future, and this is tricky for 10 in the morning, the future doesn't exist. When, when Alan Kay said uh, the best way to predict the future is to invent it, what he was saying in effect was the future is always invented and either you invent part of it yourself or you go into the future that other people have invented for you. But you don't see their invention, their hand of invention, and therefore think it's what we call what happened to happen, what merely happened in the course of the events of life itself. So if you see the present as a human construction of reality in which using current sense data, sensors, feedback loops that move information faster and faster into the collective, 
then you can see that the future is a construction of reality too that has to have some cognitive connection to the present we define that way. We invent the present out of what we know and create a structure. And then the future is that which we hold, how we hold ourselves as possibilities for action based on what we see and can possibly foresee. Now what that means when there are so many more domains of expertise is that in your domain of expertise, you may be close to the present, know almost as much as what there is to know even though no expert today can keep up with everything being published in their own domain of expertise. You are behind the line that is a little in the past, just a little in your domain of expertise, but in all these other domains of expertise which are proliferating and for which we are inventing new names all of the time, you are far in the past. And therefore we all live in the past in most domains. And therefore none of us can have the arrogance of thinking we have a clue unless we surrender ourselves to the collective, the collaboratory environment which the IT revolution created in the first place as a higher level of abstraction for how human beings have to work. We've worked in tribes, we've worked in teams before, but the IT revolution transformed the very notion of identity. So the things I predicted in the past that have come to, tr come to be true include generations born successively who are assimilated or socialized by the technologies of the time, unselfconsciously at the age of five, six, seven, into those things being what is really real. And that becomes the background point of reference or benchmark of their lives. What's really real when you're seven, eight, nine, ten is what you establish as what's really real. Everything else you call later uh, technology, but you take for granted and accept for what it is the things that are present when you are that age. That means you have to critically examine the context again and again and again. And one of the things I find myself repeating in other places uh, as well is that you must turn context into content. You must turn what for most people, for the humplings, is unseen, invisible context of life into a cognitive artifact that you can hold in your mind and turn around like a 3D manipulation on a monitor and see and therefore manage and therefore handle and therefore leverage, therefore make fundamental use of. So when I started writing fiction again, where mind games came from was when I was doing some work on ethics and intelligence over a period of a decade with people at the National Security Agency, a few from CIA, who became traumatized by the executive orders that came into the director's office, the Dernses' office, from then President Bush, saying this is what we are now going to do. They became concerned because according to the ethical structures of the 20th century, which they had believed meant these are things we never do, it is unconstitutional and illegal and we don't do it, now the executive order said we do these things and to work through and talk about the ethical implications was the point of an ad hoc group that came together for about 10 years that I co-led off site, of course. I'm always anomalous, I'm always out of sight, and I'm always on the edges, which is how I derive information. And <clears throat> it resulted in a little bit of something happening that I can't really address, but uh, it, it was a really tough slog. Uh, they were traumatized because according to the reality that had assimilated them in the past, something profoundly transformational had changed the very bedrock of their lives and now something else needed to be done. That in my talk at DEF CON and other places way back in the early 90s and even in the 80s, I said was inevitable because my whole job has been to follow the technology and how as Langdon Winter said it would reshape and restructure our political and economic and social and spiritual and religious lives by creating new structures into which young people would be assimilated without knowing it and without thinking. So it's not about President Bush's order. Obama is more Bush than Bush. When you get in the Oval Office and they hand you the daily briefing and this is what people say you must now do, uh, you have one response. When you're president, with the immense weight of responsibility that carries, you say, what do we need to do? And then they tell you what we can do, and the only sane response for leadership is to say, do it. Do it all. 
and they have been doing it all. This is why the speech, I mean, I guess it was good public relations for the director of the NSA to be here yesterday and to speak to DEF CON and to get great press. Someone told me from CNN said it was just a wonderful speech and everybody accepted him warmly. But it was complete bullshit. It was complete bullshit. It's true. He did not say one thing that had meaning, reality, currency, or relevance. And some things he said were outright lies. There's a booth over there recruiting for NSA. I love people. I've spent a day at NSA recently doing a speech and a panel and, and things. Some of my best friends from NSA. I wouldn't want my daughter to marry somebody from NSA, but uh, I don't want to live next door to someone from NSA, but some of my best friends, friends are there. And on the booth they list the attributes of the agency, and one of them was transparency. And I said, how can you even have the balls? <laughs> to put the word transparency up there as one of the things to which you are committed. And he said, well, 10 years ago, we didn't know, you didn't know who we were. Well, that's not true, but he said, uh, now people know who we are. And I said, you know, this is weasel word straight out of Orwell. That's not what transparency means. And he went into Alice in Wonderland world where words mean exactly what I mean them to say and say they mean and mean them to say, and, and they don't mean anything else but that. And at that point, you just say, uh, well, people were lining up to be recruited. People were warm and respectful. About 12, 13 years ago, I, I oversaw a panel of feds that was facing hackers who hooded at every statement. I attended a session where everybody had a pennant that said bullshit on it. And whenever a fed said something that was bullshit, they waved the pennant like this. And those pennants were always waving. That's a different kind of dialogue with hackers. Where has it gone? My, my, the children are assimilated. So the task that confronts you going forward is to reinvigorate the passion, the obsessiveness, and above all, the daring that made a hacker a hacker. But what you're going to be hacking is not just information systems anymore, because as I said, the proliferation of other domains of expertise, especially biological, especially biological, but also including manufacturing and material science and nanotechnology, and using like printers to print out manufactured items at point of origin. What is that going to do to restructure the trucking industry? How is life going to change? We don't see how things will change. You, know, you take for granted that water just comes out of the tap. 19th century, not only didn't it come out of the tap, the consensus reality was that to bathe was unhealthy. And in Boston, it was considered illegal to bathe without a doctor's prescription. Until who got a hold of that information were the plumbers and the soap manufacturers, and they started their campaign, a bath a day for everybody. And then people got into their heads, a bath a day is good. Actually, it's not so good. But you take for granted the consensus reality to which you're assimilated. And yet things are changing so much faster that it takes that collective work at understanding and a knowledge of counterintelligence push through the veil itself in order to have a clue as to what is going on. And that's going to get worse and worse. So there are going to be those few people who do it. And the ones who have the capability, some will become masters. That is, go into the agencies or work as contractors with them. Uh, do, the, do the work and be assimilated and say, look, you've got to compromise. The world is gray and, and, and so on. And others will kind of fight to the end like Timothy Leary or other people who go down fighting for the truth and fighting for their youthful passions and the other people will say you're just never going to grow up. Growing up means compromise and, and just coming to terms with it and, and loving it, loving big brother. Now it is big brother. But there are also so many little brothers. That's what Dan Gere said he was told years ago by an FBI agent. Actually it was a ranking person FBI your choice is between one big brother or many little brothers. And now everyone knows we have both. So we don't have a choice anymore. Uh, you know that ubiquitous surveillance, ubiquitous intrusion, uh, databasing uh, is, is global. I had dinner with a dear friend in Amsterdam who works with telecom companies to help them adapt policies which will enable them to do what they're going to do in the first place, is the way she defined it. She works with governments all around the world. And I said, you know, naive, will we ever get it back? Will we ever get back freedom from intrusion and surveillance? And she said, uh, oh, Richard, you know, the tone. Oh, Richard, of course not. 
it's everywhere and it's deeply embedded now. We sell everything to do it to the worst people on the planet, we being Anglo-Saxons, UK, Northern Europe, America, Canada. We sell them what they need to do it. It's, we're never going to get it back in any aspect of life. It, it, I felt like Kay in The Godfather when she said, well, Michael, but, but senators don't murder people. And he said, oh, Kay, <laughs> who's being naive now? So part of what I'm encouraging you to do is have the willingness and courage to see clearly and say clearly what you see, if only to the trusted few on whom you can rely. Because when you do counterintelligence or try to do a non-type stuff, uh, you don't know how much you're being permitted to do or allowed to do because it's so much easier to let the antelopes go to the water holes and drink and then follow the antelopes to see who the antelopes hang out with than to try to shut down the water hole. I remember there was a, a little wave of jihadist websites being taken down by well-intentioned hackers some years ago. And I said to a friend of mine, isn't it funny how quickly they spring back up? They're so resilient. And he said, okay, look, we often have to go behind the scenes, put in firewalls, rewrite the code, and put them back up. We. Uh, so that they will stay up, so we can watch the antelopes go to the water hole and drink, and then see where the antelopes go next. The whole point of counterterror is who talks to who? Relationships, communication, out to nth degrees of relationship, and who knows who. So in order to do that level of investigation to provide this, the net or oversight of safety, uh, that means surveillance and intrusion is ubiquitous. Whose side are, are you on? And are there even sides anymore? So I was disappointed in the director's speech. I, I redefined hackers to my own taste and satisfaction a few years ago when I said that uh, a black hat hacker is a hacker. A gray hat hacker is a hacker who knows when to fudge the truth. And a white hat hacker is a hacker who put the truth down somewhere and forgot where they left it. Well, the director of the agency is a white hat hacker in the best tradition. So a long time ago, things changed a little more slowly. Leonardo da Vinci predicted all kinds of things that came to be in 450 years. And then Jules Verne wrote from the earth to the moon in the 1860s and in the 1960s, only a hundred years later, we were on the moon. And Huxley talked about social conditioning and genetic engineering in the 20s and 30s in Brave New World, using a lot of the work of a brilliant guy named Haldane. Uh, whose book from 1924 you can still find in the bowels of the library somewhere. Uh, and then only uh, a generation or two later, 50 years later, Huxley's social engineering and genetic engineering is a reality of our lives and it's going to become more and more so. And then cyberspace, the word was coined by William Gibson. Uh, and 10 years later, everybody was living in and using the word cyberspace. And a couple of years ago, I did a talk on biohacking and the future of hacking in biology using markers like the president of MIT having a background in biology. People like Bill Gates saying, if I was starting again today, I would be in biology and not in computing, because that's where the cutting edge of informatics is in how you, we, are going to recreate humanity and the identity of humanity and its attributes using enhancements, augmentations, and biological engineering of all kinds. And so I gave a talk as current as I could, thinking I was really on the edge and that week, my Economist magazine came using all the same damn sources and saying, in effect, all the things I had said. A week. I had a week lag time, not as I had 16 years ago, a few years for people to catch up. This is why, you know, for anyone uh, not to be confused really means, as the physicist said, that we don't understand what is going on. Identity, as I mentioned, has become corporate. It can't help but become corporate. Here's a quote from a physicist named Henry Stapp. An elementary particle, he said, is not an element independently existing unanalyzable entity. It is in essence a set of relationships that reach out and to other things. If you get what that's about, he's saying that what's primary in the universe is relationship, not the things that are related. It is the angles of relationship that determine who we are in terms of the multiplicity of communication and energy, linear pathways we 
create in our lives to enhance our understanding of what's happening. So if you reduce yourself to someone in solitude, uh, like those wonderful fictional lone uh, hackers who are so aggrandized uh, as, as the, uh, the image of hacking itself, then you've, you've been deceived, you have become self-deceived. That image of the lone passionate rebel hacker is a literary fiction. It is a fiction that people like to assimilate because you have all been assimilated into many Borgs by now. And the question is, to which Borgs will we relate in order to be assimilated into the structures of possibility and ethos that we value and care about? So when they talk about corporate identity, what we're really saying is that the individual, as it was constructed post-Renaissance, as an identity of self, as who we thought we were, individuals with boundaries around them, that's over. That's over. Uh, nation states, which grew in the 18th and 19th, uh, 17th and 20th centuries, as appropriate boundaries for the speed of the flow of information into and out of complex systems, as an appropriate level of abstraction to organize our social and economic and political and spiritual lives. Those boundaries, as you know, have gone down. The function of the intelligence community today is de facto to make sure that people know that when they wake up in the morning, the world in which they went to sleep will pretty much be recognizably persistent so they can get on with their lives. It's like, uh, you know, uh, men in black, right? There's always an Archelian battle cruiser hanging off the earth. And the reason people go about their daily lives and line up at Starbucks and do all the things we do is because we don't know it. This is why when you go down the rabbit hole and you go into dark stuff, you become traumatized by what you find. A therapist a number of years ago, this is a warning, serious message and warning, told me that I was showing the symptoms of, uh, of uh, secondary trauma. She asked me to read about trauma. And I said, okay, and I went and read all the books I, I, uh, she had recommended and I came back and she said, do you, do you know why I read that and I, why I wanted you to read those? And I said, sure, because the people I'm talking to uh, have been traumatized. Now, who was I talking to? This is before the Washington Post and others outed for the rendition was public. I was talking to people who tortured, and I was talking to people who were tortured. You know, this is not trivial. I started writing in the 90s. As soon as people start writing op-eds about when can we torture, you know the jig was up because you will always find justifications for torture, and that will mean just like all these people coming out of the Innocence Project now who are jailed, unfortunately, that we will sometimes torture the wrong human beings. And talking to people who were tortured, even if you can justify it, you know, this is not a TV series like 24, where if you don't shoot them in the kneecap, you know, you're not gonna find the nukes. It doesn't work that way. That's propaganda and spin. She said, no, I don't want you to read these things so you know about the people you're talking to who were traumatized. I want you to read them because you are showing signs of secondary trauma. Talking to people who more and more and more are filtering into your life. Anomalous reality which the consensus reality people, the humplings, don't want to know about. More and more normal talks to normal people. I have people say, I don't want to know about that. Or as a guy said a few years ago, stop it, you're making me feel helpless. And I said, great. When you came in here, you were at minus two. You were helpless and you didn't know it. I've moved you up to one, which is helpless and aware of it. You want to go up another notch to ground zero? He said, what's that? And I said, taking personal responsibility for doing the relearning and retooling that will let you be responsible for your life in the face of the radical change that we can't make go away. Now, cross someone's face when you say that. There's a glimmer of, I can do that for just a nanosecond. And then it goes back into a life posture of, screw you, I know. No, and that's the danger going forward. There's a lot of people being manipulated into thinking something so that's not so, who feel victimized, angry, and resentful. And when the catastrophic event that is going to come, comes, whatever its source, they will be ripe for exploitation as flocks of, digital, flocks of real birds in a digital cage because they will have already been assimilated into the mind structure that is intended to make them more malleable. So the image of the lone hacker is self-deception. I wrote a piece about that for the, the DVD. And it's not about Bush or Obama. It's about what's so in the world as a result of the technological transformation of the time. And so it's also about what's coming. 
Hackers see deeply. They see what's happening. I mentioned talking to artists. Study visual art. Why? Because most of us just see the picture and don't notice that the picture is defined by a frame and don't see that the frame is defined by a ground of being, a wall, a structure, an architectural space, an architectonic level of fractal-like abstractions that define the physical space which we think is, quote, real, but which has been created for us into which to walk, both visually and actually, as if it is real, and then we live in it as if it's real, and then we create it together as a consensus reality, and we call it life. We call it what's so. Hackers see the context. They see more deeply. They see that the thing can be made to do all kinds of things it wasn't intended to do. And so what's coming out of bio? The people I talk to aren't, a, they talk about cyber war. They're not afraid of cyber like they're afraid of bio. Somebody asked me, I think last year, what keeps you up at night? And I said, what keeps me up at night is the head technologist that I know at, at CIA telling me he can't sleep because he's reading the FISA intercepts about what people all over the world are trying to do. You know, humans being the kind of land mammal that we are, we will do almost anything for narrow self-interest and short-term gain, even if it means suiciding ourselves, not with a bomb, but with a disease. Look for the unknown unknowns. Look at how many people crossing borders into this country have exotic or unexpectedly high numbers of diseases. See if you can get that data. Like we discussed years ago, did you hear about the train that crashed with a load of chemicals? No. Well, if you don't know about it, it's not a terrorist act because terrorists attack the mind of society and that means proliferation and exaggeration and amplification by the media, which is uh, complicitous with their work because their self-interest converges with that of the terrorists, which is to terrify people so that you can keep things going. You know, we knew what happened in Aurora within 10 minutes, right? We didn't need five or six days of detailed interviews with every, every victim or family of victim or someone who was traumatized by it. That traumatizes us in turn like 9-11 did. The media amplifying the images of the planes hitting the, the buildings over and over again, that amplified and created the terroristic event that would have been not nearly so potent in the soul and psyche of Americans uh, as, as it became. So part of what hackers are supposed to do is see this stuff. I mean, I, I believe futuring is what Dyson said. I'm going to quote Freeman Dyson. I'm interested in the long run, the remote future, where qualitative predictions are meaningless. The only certainty in that remote future is that radically new things will be happening. I have always said, go look at the toys people are playing with for one of the domains. Look at R&D from the intelligence and dark communities. Uh, look at the vice industries to see where the money is flowing because everybody loves that stuff. That's why it's called vice. Uh, it means it's stuff we like, you know, secondary sexual triggers. What happens to a human, a man, when he sees a sexual trigger, secondary trigger? He gets excited and he feels pleasure. So what is he going to do? He's going to look at that which excites him and gives him pleasure. That's a no-brainer. And so we're going to uh, f make it a felony or whatever to, to do that uh, so that the industry can thrive in the black market of collusion and exchange. Um, last year I talked about the banking industry and how complicit it was in the money laundering and, and drug cartels and all those other things. So that I, I'm not making stuff up. This is from subcommittee hearings of Congress that if the money that flows into the U.S. economy from cartels and, and arms trade and uh, dictators stashing their money abroad. If it all vanished, our economy would collapse overnight. So it's just seeing clearly what's so and trying to find your moral compass in that. What those intelligence people were trying to do was wrestle with applying the ethics or ethos based on a prior conception of human identity formed by other technologies in the 20th century and past and trying to apply it to the kind of humanity you are already becoming and your children and your children's children will become because they won't be merely born, they will be engineered, enhanced, augmented, and changed, and they will have the reins of their own capabilities and capacities in their own hands. Now, that's what distinguishes people, the ones who are going to make it and the ones who don't. Wonderful book called What Successful College Students Do. What do they do? When they fail at something and can't learn something, then they 
say, how can I learn this? How can I approach it? They don't allow themselves to know that they can't know something, and they find a way to learn it. They find a way to advance themselves. That's one bunch. The others are in that helpless basket that I mentioned, and they say, I can't do it. And there's a whole world of people in their 40s and 50s and 60s out there who are flummoxed and blindsided by what is happening and do not understand its sources. And in my hometown of Milwaukee, the leadership refuses to name that the jobs they want will never come back because the world which created them is never going to exist again. So kids are one of the things I like to look at. Kids 15 years ago, DEF CON 4, were playing with robotics. Seymour Papert's Mindstorms had just come out. And you say, robotics is the future. Well, now there are robots everywhere. And the questions are, how can we make them friendly? You believe Siri, right? You believe she's your personal Geisha, right? You love her. Admit it. You love her. Who love? Come on, raise your hand. Who, who has? Thank you. All right. You love talking to Siri. My car, my Prius, has a French accent that I prefer to the English accent because that makes her my special friend. <laughs> Secondary triggers. We are evolved to respond to them as if that's what's so. What are kids playing with today? Kids are playing video games that are controlled by their minds. They have bands around their heads. They make balls levitate and move through hoops. They levitate objects. They are moving toward wearing the beanies, which increasingly are replacing the implants, which enable the electromagnetic intentionality of the human organism organism that you are to do in effect what is telekinesis. Next, of course, is ubiquitous, always on, telepathic and clairvoyant communication among the nodes of the network, which is going to be global humanity, and the idea of carrying what we used to call a telephone. Do you remember? We called it a phone. That will become as obsolete as when my mother would say to me early on, shh, I'm on long distance. Right? Long distance has disappeared as a contextual category. Uh, not being always on and connected with one another, which older people say, oh, isn't it terrible? They can't live alone. No, they can't. Because they've been born into a collective that connects them always, and that is going to increasingly be enhanced biologically and with appliances so that you are always on without having to carry stuff, type stuff, touch stuff and sometimes even say stuff. Voice is the next big thing for the ubiquitous internet, which is in all things and in us, in our cars, in our clothing, in our minds, in our brains. That's what's right around the corner. Be careful. There's a talk coming up on uh, augmentation. Pay attention to it, because if you screwed up with your computer hacking 15 years ago, yeah, the FBI might knock down your door, but if you weren't 18, you were cool. If you screw up putting an appliance into your body or mind because you don't understand the medical consequences, go to that talk. I mean, it's a guy in third year medical school who really knows what he's talking about. It's worth it. It's worth it. How do you handle the anxiety that I'm talking about emerging necessarily from these pursuits on the edges? You do it through mutuality, feedback, and accountability. Those are always the antidotes to the rigidity and the fear and the isolation that people feel in the face of radical change. Feynman, the great physicist, said, with more knowledge comes deeper and deeper and more wonderful mystery. Learning went on to penetrate deeper still. That's, let me see how we are. That's a great watchword to keep in mind. But look at what kids are playing with now and see that this is what's going to be present in the future. I've mentioned this before, and I'm, if I can find it toward the end because I'm always way ahead of myself. Uh, I was standing by the museum in Milwaukee not that long ago, and I looked at a list of things that they were selling for kids to play with. It include thought reactors, telekinetic and telepathic objects, and extraterrestrial life. Now, I think it's time for me to say something about that, right? Since I talked about hacking ufology a few years ago. Um, one of the things, one of the things that I know will happen in this century is that we will not just know that there's life everywhere, but we will know it. 
We will know it and we will know that we know it. Now most of you already know it, but you might not know that you know it. Nothing has been more effective in managing the herd than the whole subject of UFOs. The whole subject. Uh, why? Because in 1952, the intelligence community and the military community decided for good reason that it was a threat to the well-being of society because the Russians could use it to manipulate us, to shut down our communications, and people would panic if they knew what was happening. And the Robertson panel in 1952 created debunking and ridiculing as the appropriate response, even with the most ridiculous assignation of causes to things that have been observed by multiple witnesses and that were self-consistent in what was reported about the vehicles flying around. Now, granted that that was a passion of mine ever since I was a priest and a colonel told me sitting alone in the basement in 1978 that UFOs were real. Told me why they chased them, told me why they couldn't catch them, and told me why it couldn't be our technology or the Russians, or anything else that was terrestrial. If nothing else, we couldn't take the G's when you do a right angle turn and going from zero to 10,000. If you have a body that evolved from an insect life instead of a mammal, you can take those G's. But I don't want to go to the speculative stuff. That's just kind of fun to play with. You know what the alien heads look like. It looks like a fly, right? Uh, big black eyes, but that's not what we're talking about. What a group of others and myself start doing five years ago was research project, a research historical project into how did the military and intelligence communities respond to the phenomena. We don't make any conclusions that are crazy, no speculation. We don't decide what the phenomena is. We leave that entirely up to the reader. But we use only documents from within the military and intelligence community from World War II up to the present found by combing through the archives for years, years and decades to find these nuggets of gold that could connect to show us what they did and why they did it. It was complex, it was multifaceted, and it was deeply, deeply real. The result came out last week. It's called UFOs in Government, a Historical Inquiry, and I am very proud to be listed among the authors of it. There are almost a thousand citations. I have one book I can sell for the usual price. That is, it's 30 bucks. He's not going to put it in electronic form for a long time. Um, and I have a few copies of Mind Games. I always carry Mind Games. That's only 20 bucks. So it sounds cheap. The point, though, of bringing that up is that we spent years researching and combing out and eliminating anything speculative from what we present as historical, scholarly, academic research into the phenomena and how it was treated from the 40s forward and why. And when you understand how the national security apparatus works, it makes perfect sense for the decisions to have been made, but they did it wrong and it resulted in a lot of blowback. And besides, they can't control the phenomena, which is not us or ours and continues to show up and therefore has probably been researched why? Because things that were seen and documented in the 40s and 50s were thought to be impossible then. Stealth technology, not on radar. Invisibility cloaking. Electromagnetic pulse weapons. Particle weapons. Beams. Lasers. And a list of other technological advancements which we now take for granted exist because we made them, but which were thought impossible when they were trying to speculate on where could the things come from. And they thought Mars because we hadn't been anywhere in the solar system, much less the galaxy. On the edges, right? On the edges, being called crazy, being ridiculed. It is the fate of anyone who hacks the truth and reality seriously, but refuses to be taken in by all the subterfuge and craziness of those who would spin you into other assembled and constructed worlds in order to make you less potent. It takes discernment, it takes mindfulness, it takes vigilance, and it takes a lifelong passion and commitment to simply finding out what's real and what we can do to make reality do the things that we want it to do. What well, we got, one minute? One minute. Q&A. <laughs>
Uh, and we'll do more Q&A in the Q&A room for anyone who wants to know. I mean, you, I, I joke about it, but it's true. I had about 20 pages, and I made it to page four because uh, I got uh, uh, exercised about how the uh, Dernse spoke. I thought it was an insult, an embarrassing insult to us and our intelligence uh, to treat us like uh, feeble sheep. Anybody bang? Uh, any questions? Microphone for questions. You were talking about uh, like alien technologies and giving a list of uh, things that were science fiction in the past but are now realities today. Uh, are you insinuating that we have like reverse engineered some of these technologies from... Um... See, that's the trouble. That's the trouble. Everything I stayed with was really just solid and grounded. And I said, now this is speculative. Let's think about how we got there. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. No, I'm insinuating nothing. I'm not even saying they're extraterrestrial or that we know what they're about. I don't know. Our conclusion in 500 pages with 1,000 citations is that part of the problem was that the intelligence military communities, certainly in the 40s and 50s, didn't know. They knew they had something real. They knew it was doing things that were astonishing. And that's where we start our story. In World War II with Foo Fighters, and then the waves that began 47 uh, with Arnold, and then progressively well into the 70s and 80s. And we have experts from other countries uh, who wrote chapters on those countries. Um, Sweden, uh, chapter on France, chapter on Spain. Uh, we talk about Belgium, we talk about Brazil. Uh, it's global phenomena, and other governments have done other things. France made it a major priority, and they have again, because they say out loud, at the top levels of government, this is a real phenomena, and it's doing things we need to learn from. So all I'm saying is, it makes sense that there was at least some people, certainly, who were paying attention to the capabilities. I could suggest hearsay about that, but that's not, that book is not about hearsay, that suggests at least we knew things were possible toward which we moved. But am I saying there was uh, serious research and development based on the saucer they got at Roswell or whatever? No. Yeah, no. I know that um, our understanding of space travel is, is currently running up against a wall, uh, like uh, the theory of relativity and um, how years pass in space over distance. And um, I, can, I can't really address those from here. That's a big question about a sidebar, and I'd like to stay on the main themes if anybody else has a question. I'll, I'll talk to you in the Q&A room about that stuff, okay? Wait, one, one more question. By the nature of parallel contexts, aren't we all humplings in a certain way? Absolutely. Absolutely. But some are more humpling than others. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, some people are utterly unselfconscious and uncritical <laughs> about how their ideas came into their heads, whether it was talk radio or whatever it was. They don't know how they got where they were. They don't see the structures of insinuation, complexity, and, and device that create ideas and move people in the direction in which they are intended to go in, in all kinds of domains. Uh, when, when they changed the name of Medill School of Journalism to Journalism and Public Relations, you knew the jig was up. Mm -hmm. It, it meant that manipulation and spin and all the things we know about, which started with Eddie Bernays and, and others in the early 20th century, it's great history of how propaganda and spin came to be the dominant means of communication. Yeah, I used to work in advertising, and actually I used your Eddie Bernays uh, analogy to talk about uh, context, the idea the of context. context yeah. and, you know, the, I'm glad uh, I didn't use it again then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, he saw me, we got to quit. I do have a, a few books if somebody wants one. I mean, really, just a few. Um, and this UFO book, check it out online. Go to my website and just click the link and read the discussion of it. Just see, with an open mind, that the history of the subject is worth investigating at the depth and in the detail that we did it because the compelling conclusions are important for the 21st century. Thank you very much.